so welcome back students so this will be our concluding lecture with respect to the module 3 we will now conclude with the special uh, a case study so in the previous lectures we have studied the rheological properties we have defined the constitutive relationships and we have also seen how a rheometer exactly works now this current lecture will actually give us a measure or it will tell us in the case of viscoelastic fluid because viscoelastic fluid i have not taken much in detail so i will take one example and uh, which will be subjected to certain stresses and you will see the results from there okay so we start with the lecture rheology a case study on hydrogel synthesis so what do we uh, cover here in this lecture first is with a rheometer what we can do so we have to define the oscillation testing so oscillation testing as i told you it is nothing but you send a sine wave in the form of strain and then you record the response in the form of stress and if they are just on top of each other we say they are in phase if they were lag i mean lag means they not coincide on each other the waves then we define a lag angle alpha so that is what we will be doing so we will do one how we do the testing on this particular fluid so we make some material we make some gel material for example in my case we will be discussing the hydrogel so what are hydrogels i will explain you later so that gel are soft gel like material so the hardness is defined by the both elasticity and viscosity so we will see what are those different constituents and how to measure those first is the amplitude sweep then is the stress and strain sweep and then case study on hydrogel so amplitude state stress strain sweep these relates to if i send a oscillatory wave okay if i send a oscillatory wave with keeping frequency constant but having different amplitude so then we get a amplitude sweep so how does the material respond when the amplitude of the sine wave is increased as the time proceeds okay so as the time gets further away from zero your amplitude gets increased but the frequency remains constant that is called amplitude sweep same way we can also define stress and strain sweep it is defined in a similar manner like amplitude sweep in this what you do you control either strain or you control stress and then you record either stress or strain either way conversely you can record the other property that is called sweep then the case study of hydrogel other than these sweeps there is also these three time sweep frequency sweep temperature sweep time sweep and temperature sweep i will come later because this will govern we govern on the particular materials which you have used to prepare the hydrogel so when the gel forms and what temperature it forms in those cases it is a in situ measurement it's a time sweep and temperature sweep then the frequency sweep is something like you have the original material you um, subject it to intense frequency then you measure the frequency so we'll see one by one in the subsequent slides but prior to that we need to find out an important aspect in the case of oscillation experiment which is the linear viscoelastic regime lvr so in any material we cannot just simply put them under intense stress with uh, as much amplitude as you want because if you put them under such high stress what will happen the entire molecule will break down so we will not be able to measure anything so we have to measure the point till which we can subject to stress or the point till which we can increase or maintain the strain constant so for these properties that is the critical properties we call that this a regime till that aim where the linear viscoelastic regime means the material property does not change much if you apply stress up to that point defined by the linear viscoelastic regime so what do you define if the deformation is tiny enough and done slowly enough the molecular configuration never deviate from equilibrium but this mechanical reaction is just a reflection of a continuous dynamic process occurring at the molecular level even in a equilibrium state huh? so it means that uh, uh, if i apply some stress it will able to recover itself and get back to its original state till that time it does so that is called the linear viscoelastic domain 
So in this case stress and strain magnitude are linearly linked and the behavior of any liquid may be fully characterized by a single function of time. So for example, if I want to subject it to a particular uh, let us say strain okay, and I measure both G prime and G double prime, suppose this is the plot, suppose uh, this is G prime, this is G double prime. The units are same, I am putting the y axis and this is x axis. Here I can write down strain, log of strain I am writing out, okay, log of strain. Now what you do, you apply a particular strain, keep on applying the strain. So what it will happen is your G prime, which is the elasticity, G prime is the elasticity, it will come like this, 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 initially it will be horizontal, then it will drop down like this. While in the case of G double prime, it will be something like this, I'm sorry, I have made it much more maybe I should drop it further, yes. So this is G prime, okay, storage modulus. Now when the loss modulus means the ability of flow, so it will start in a lower magnitude, so it will go like this, 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 it will go like this, then it will somehow fall down. So at increasing strain rate obviously the viscosity everything will decreases, so both the elasticity as well as the loss modulus will fall down. But we are more concerned about whether in the particular material can regain its original shape. So that is why this is G double prime, G prime is very important. So we will take this particular horizontal area where this gamma L becomes the particular strain rate. The strain rate you will find out at this point where it remains horizontal because after this what happens there is a crossover point where the G prime and G double prime curves cross each other. It means that the molecule is totally trying to deform, it is breaking down and it is starting to flow. So when it starts to flow then the loss modulus takes over the storage modulus, okay. So we will see one example and prior to that we will just revise what was G prime, G double prime. I know many of you, I mean you may not recollect the previous class, so I just write down what do mean by oscillation again just to make you uh, comfortable. So uh, you know you have a stress in a sinusoidal symbol and you have a strain also in a sinusoidal symbol. So the difference between these two we now just discussed is called as phase angle, okay. This is called phase angle. So now the phase angle is something like this, so now we have a frequency which is equal to n sigma is equal to n into strain rate, so n is the viscosity, so strain rate is given by this expression, omega is the angular frequency. So what you do is in the case we apply dynamic stress sinusoidally. So we can either uh, define a user define a stress, we can either give, a, give stress in measure strain or we define strain measure stress. So now what is the difference, how are the frequency and these related to each other? So it is something like this, so you are now twisting it, the material has been twisted like this way. So it is always you measure the frequency and uh, angular frequency, so frequency is uh, units is hertz which is not a SI unit, so it is always better to convert it into SI unit, so that is why we talk about angular frequency which is the case here, omega. So how are this frequency and uh, angular frequency uh, defined? it is defined in this manner, see it means that uh, omega, omega which is the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi f, okay, 2 pi f. So f is the frequency in hertz, omega is the frequency in radians per second, okay. So it means that uh, if I want to write down a frequency of 10 hertz, so what does it mean? It means it goes 10 cycles per second it gives 10 cycles per second. So in this case, so if it is 10 cycles per second, so it means the omega will be, so if you put this here 10 cycles per second, omega will be 62.8 radians per second, okay. Now see this is the way you, so it means this is the entire cycle in this case in our rheometer, this is a cycle, the entire cycle is traversed. So one cycle goes in one second, so frequency is 1, so if frequency is 1, omega will be 6.28, so frequency then if it is 1 hertz, omega is equal to 6.28, so that is how it is, so if it is 10, you will get 62.8, I just wrote it so that 
it makes sense. So, this is 6.28 radians per second. Now, what happens if you increase this, you take it to 12.56. So, now what happens is you will have one, uh, two, so this is 1 and 2, 2 cycles coming. Then take it at 50, well this scale is not to be uh, measured properly, so you will get 50, like something like that, I mean you have to com compute, if it is 50 radians per second, you put here 50, so number of cycles will be 50, this is equal to 2 pi into f. So, you can compute f from here this relation 50 by 2 pi. So, these many cycles likewise you can calculate. So, that is why this omega and frequency are interrelated to each other. So, this is very important. So, what is frequency? You should understand frequency is the number of cycles the wave travels in one second while omega is related to frequency if you multiply it with the product of 2 pi. Fine, with this we move ahead. So, now uh, issue is now what is the amplitude, how to define amplitude and if we define amplitude can we define in such a manner such that the amplitude increases slowly with time. For example, I have shown here the peak amplitude in displacement and the torque wave which is similar, torque is similar to like stress you can convert torque to stress through that uh, rheometer constant. So, this is one amplitude, this is one other. So, these are increasing amplitude, okay. 1, 2, 3, increasing amplitude. But if you see number of cycles uh, it has traversed is 2, there is 2 cycles, here again it is 2 cycle, here again it is 2 cycles. So, the amplitude is changing. So, if the amplitude here is A, here it is 2A, here it is 3A. So, issue is can we club this all together and send it in a programmed manner? Can we do that? That is called amplitude sweep. So, in the amplitude sweep, we send a signal in this manner. So, if I draw here the curve, the resultant curve here, let us say it first goes the first cycle having this A. Let us suppose this is A, this part is A amplitude. Now, the second cycle would be slightly taller. So, this is B. So, I should not write B, I should write 2A, fine. So, the amplitude is twice this and then you make another cycle slightly higher, go like this, come like this, yeah. So, then it becomes 3A, this part is 3A. So, it means if I can draw out, so this is it. This is the first cycle. Second cycle with increasing amplitude, and this is the final. This is the fourth cycle. So now you see, I am keeping the frequency as constant. Frequency is constant here in the rheometer. I am keeping the frequency as constant, but I am changing the amplitude. So, here it was A, here it was 2A, here it was 3A. Now, what I am going to do is that I will do this, I will keep on increasing the amplitude until at a point the material breaks down. So, the point where it breaks down, we record that stress, strain or whatever property you want to define. So, that will actually tell us or that will actually direct us what is the linear viscoelastic regime. It means up to this point the material is stable, after that the molecules just simply break down and the loss modulus overtakes the storage modulus. Okay. So, now what we do is obviously in the dynamic and mechanical testing an oscillatory deformation is applied to a sample, this deformation is applied and you measure the response. So, the material response can be either in stress or strain, so depend upon what you want from your experiment. The phase angle, phase shift, again I am repeating, this is very important, you are measuring this. So, if it is close to 0, it is, I repeated earlier in the last class, it is 0, means totally uh, elastic material. If it is close to 1, it is viscous material, it is liquid, that is how we have to uh, interpret. That is what I have repeated here. So, when uh, alpha, I am sorry, this should be alpha actually should be alpha. The alpha if it is exactly on the same 
stress and strain are related to each other. So, it is 0, it is a pure Hookean solid which is an elasticity. So, it follows the Hooke's law and in this case if it is a purely viscous response, it will be just the opposite of each other. So, you will have entire this angle to be 90 degree. So, this 90 degree means it is a follows the Newton's laws of viscosity. This is what we will do. So, obviously, you uh, be in the viscous elastic material, the responses will be between uh, uh, something uh, the angle will be between 0 to 90 degree. So, that is what our entire experiment is all about. Now, uh, I have told you the material response to increasing deformation amplitude is monitored at a constant frequency and temperature. Okay. So, uh, we now send the uh, amplitude. So, now the amplitude may be in terms of strain or it may be in terms of stress, both are sine waves. So, in the sine waves you can formulate the equation, you may recollect the equation sigma is equal to uh, gamma m into this sine of omega t. Now, this sine of omega t either you can send a gamma in the form of gamma is equal to gamma m sine omega t or you can write down in the form of sigma. Either way you can send the signal and in that case if you send the signal in this case whether it is stress or strain you can apply the increasing amplitude 1. So, again this is a, this is 2a, this is something like 3a like that you keep on going. So, uh, the frequency is maintained constant, the frequency is f here same f here f here like that. So, here a uh, frequency is kept constant. So, you can measure that and you determine the linear viscosity regime. So, then uh, though we assume that the test sample is stable. If not stable, we use time sweep to determine stability. So, we will come to that later. The time sweep is actually uh, depends on the precursor material, how they are behaving. Fine. So, this is how it looks like actually if you apply the stress overall stress overall stress is this much so this stress is uh, uh, you know this uh, you can recollect you can recollect this sigma star complex stress is equal to uh, some ima real part sigma real plus a sigma imaginary part so sigma to i terms of imaginary part uh, we wrote uh, this expression. So, this is that complex stress, how the overall stress will uh, look like, but we are not interested in the overall stress. We are interested in the loss modulus. The loss modulus is plotted here. The loss modulus G prime, you see it goes in a very linear fashion, horizontal fashion till this point. At this point, it actually goes down. So, it means at this point, the molecule starts to break, start to deform it starts to flow I will say. So, if it starts to flow you cannot conduct any experiment after that because it will be like a liquid like behavior, ah, viscous behavior. So, uh, you can say that here if you again plot G double prime, uh, it will just actually uh, you know it will just be coming close to each other. Uh, so, G double prime may be something like this, I am not plotted here. So, it will be something like this, it will come some and it will fall down. Okay. So, G double prime will try to overtake each other. So, it means it will come to close each other. So, more time it takes to come close with each other, a still a better stability. So, if it immediately let us say it falls down very rapidly like this, then it means immediately it has uh, this particular peak then it will be like this. So, immediately it started to flow. Okay. So, it means we have two region, the linear region where the modulus is independent of strain. So, it means that if I am uh, passing a strain sigma equal to sigma m sin omega t. So, this particular sigma is c you are increasing, increasing, increasing the amplitude, uh, nothing is happening. So, it is irrespective of strain, you are having a constant value of the g prime. But in the nonlinear region, modulus here is becomes a function of strain. So, this part to this part, so function of strain. Okay, so, this is important the critical strain. So, what we do you record this critical strain. So, that in the next experiment when you do uh, frequency analysis or other oscillation you should not go beyond this strain that is why you need to know the linear viscosity regime. So, now we go to the example, the example is a case study. The what is case study? Case study is all about the 
Uh, in our uh, this is a case study what we do we prepare soft solid. Soft solid consists of these two components in our lab we have prepared this xylan gelatin hydrogel. Hydrogel is a soft solid. So, what happens is xylan have OH group and gelatin have NH2 group ok. See here so, this is xylan and this is sorry this is gelatin this is xylan ok. So, if they are linked with a component which is edge, the edge full form is ethyl glide di, uh, it is a ether, it is a cross linker. So, the exact name what it does is effectively it has a epoxiding, the epoxiding opens up and it helps to link this particular gelatin with xylan. When it links, it becomes a gel like material, these are the gel like materials you see here, this is a gel like material form. So, we have done some application, the application part we will not discuss metal ion absorption and the drug delivery that is different thing. Uh, so, this is what it is. So, we will study how this gel is formed and then we will subject it to rheological experiments. So, how does uh, the preparation happens? Now, the you must be knowing xylan, the xylan is uh, something like you get from biomass. So, xylan you can extract from biomass, it is a hemicellulose. So, if you want to extract hemicellulose or xylan from a biomass in plant material, what you do? You subject it to acid treatment. If it subjects to acid treatment, the hemicellulose comes out. Hemicellulose comes out in the form of compound which are sugars. So, these hemicellulose sugars are one of them is xylan. So, this xylan is obtained from biomass and gelatin you must be knowing the gelatin is a we have been using many food items. So, these do not react with each other, okay, but it will react in the presence of a basic medium. So, what we do is that we actually solubilize both xylan and the gelatin in a alkaline medium, okay, 0.5 molar alkaline medium. So, you otherwise it would not react, I mean it will never react if you just do not do through this alkaline medium. So, this two is then sent into this particular setup you measure the temperature and drop this cross linker into this two neck flask. If you draw this into the two neck flask, what you get is in the fourth step, you will get a gel formation, this hydrogel. So, this hydrogel will have some alkaline medium with it, sodium hydroxide. So, what you do? You wash it with acid and deionized water. In the first step, you wash it with deionized water to reduce the alkalinity and then you apply hydrochloric acid slowly so as to neutralize this gel. So, what you have is a soft material. So, uh, how will you know it is neutralized? You measure the pH of this solution. So, this is completes the synthesis procedure where xylan and gelatin are cross linked together with this cross linker edge. So, let us see what is the reaction. So, reaction is something like this. So, what we did we prepared three samples 50 50 where each of them is an equal amount of xylan and gelatin then 75 25. So, we call this nomenclature is x g 1 is 50 50, 75 25 is x g 3, there is more of yeah, you know you have more of this xylan. Then 83.17 percent, so it is I think 4 and a half to 1. So, we have prepared these three samples ok. So, when you prepare these three samples something uh, sort of uh, compound formation uh, will be forming here. Okay. So, uh, you see these are uh, xylan gelatin, this is another the xylan gelatin is see this is a um, gelatin um, compound here and this is the xylan compound here. Now, they are this is what uh, the cross linker is this one, this is the cross linker which is edge E D edge E ethylene uh, diglycoside ether, glycoside means this particular ring is called glycoside ring. This glycoside ring when kept in the presence of alkaline medium and 50 degree Celsius, they will link together in the form of gel. Now, I have varied these two composition, you will get three different samples. Okay. So, these three different samples, we will see how it look like, but before that we we'll see how it actually reacts. I mean we do not need to go into the reaction mechanism in detail, but I will just like to uh, just discuss. So, see xylan is here and uh, gelatin is here. So, what they do? They have a lone pair on oxygen, in gelatin has a lone pair on nitrogen. Now, this when it is sent into a 
alkaline medium uh, what it does is it will just attack the C1 that is it follows the SN2 mechanism. So, it will cleave that particular epoxy ring of edge at C1 ok, C1 is this carbon atom. So, then it will follow a SN2 mechanism, so it will attach itself, so this is a intermediate same way it will also attach the gelatin to the other end, it will cleave the epoxy ring and uh, the excess water of the OH uh, water in the solution, what it will do? It will take up the oxygen atom here in this right, you have this intermediate getting formed, then this OH, uh, this OH will attack here it forms a OH group here in this part and again to complete the reaction the hydroxyl ion from the solution reacts at the C1 substituted both ends and uh, it gets reduced. So, you have NH this side and you have CH2O this side. So, this gets reduced with the help of the hydroxyl anion. So, finally, you get a linking gel which is between gelatin and xylan. Okay. So, because in the basic median both this are behaves as a nucleophilic region, so that is why it can easily take up electrons. So, this is what the exactly the gels look like, these are the soft gels. So, now uh, this is 1 is to 1 molar ratio A part and B part is the 3 is to 1 ratio and 5 is to 1 ratio is um, the C part, C1, this C. So, if you see, uh, you see the characterization of this gel is different. So, in the A part it looks uh, you know a little bit uh, flat, it is you know it is spread out if I talk in terms of surface tension, it is like a sessile type of uh, drop, while in the case of the 2 B and C it looks more like a rigid gel uh, because uh, you have or I can in other words I can say there is a lot of cross linking happening in the B and C. So, now to in order to characterize this we need to do rheological study. So, this rheological study that is why it is very important on these particular gels. So, we have subjected all these to first amplitude sweep. So, uh, okay, this is a morphological study you can have a look at it how does it look like in under the you know under TEM uh, this uh, transmission electron microscopy and uh, the cross linking is quite visible here if you see these are cross linking structures are there in the gel. So, we can say that the cross linking has happened. Uh, so, and we are also did the FT IR spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy where we saw that uh, certain groups disappeared while you take the initial and final groups. So, it means those groups are consumed and if it is consumed it means they are interconnected with each other because it is consumed. So, that is the proof we have the morphological study you see here there is a networked uh, structure. Now, for the amplitude sieve what we do is the rheological test were performed on an interfacial rheometer. Now, this particular rheometer I have already provided you the actual instrument in the previous lecture the Anton Parr Physica MCR 301. Uh, we took a 50 mm uh, this because it is a soft gel the viscosity will be uh, so we took a higher or a larger di plate diameter and 1 degree angle we used a cone plate geometry at this temperature and we the truncation gap uh, you can recollect the truncation gap this is the truncation gap. So, if this is the sample this truncation gap is 0.1 mm and the degree angle uh, this one this angle is 1 degree which obviously I am doing it light here, but you will never able to observe such a thing in a normal uh, cone. Now, what we did we sent a shear rate the sinusoidal form and uh, by varying it from this to this. Okay. Now, to obtain the gel point as well as to determine the viscoelastic nature of the hydrogel the amplitude and frequency tube were first performed. Now, the flow behavior of hydrogels for first analyzed by the power law model. Now, what is power law model? Power law model will tell us whether the particular soft liquid or soft gel will be shear thinning or shear thickening. So, when it will be shear thinning? When this n is n minus 1 is less than 1, fine. So, viscosity is going down. If this n minus 1 is greater than 1, it means the shear thickening, the viscosity will increase with shear rate. Okay. So, this is why we have to fit the viscosities, apparent viscosities obtained with this power law model. 
So this is what the apparent viscosity with shear rate. We have applied shear rate from 10 to the power of minus 2 to 10 to the power of 3. Okay. So now you have these three samples xg1, xg3, xg5 and we subject it to shear rate. Now see it initially increases, the viscosity initially increases then it dies down. So what can we infer from this? There is a hump in the viscosity profile at the low shear rate initially. This is primarily due to the resistance offered by the cross-link gels. So uh, initial this part why increasing because it is a resistance I mean you know they are all connected with each other strongly so it will try to oppose the shear because of this opposition you get this viscosity in a higher range in the initial part then it drops down because it will overcome in eventually all the, uh, the it will overcome the, the connection the interconnectivity between these two compounds and it will viscosity will fall down irrespective of the composition it will fall down whether it is xg1 xg3 or xg5 it will just fall down now we can also infer is that the with the increasing shear rate a decrease in viscosity can be observed so what is this uh, decrease in viscosity means uh, why this will be decrease i just now told you it is the deformation of hydrogel at a higher shear rate is so the hydrogel will deform it will try to flow so that's why the viscosity will decrease it will be more like a liquid like behavior the phase transformation from gel to a solution is occurring at a higher shear rate and therefore decreasing trend in okay so from gel to solution uh, you know this you know, something like this at a higher shear rate we can say it is falling down so earlier it was there so maybe if we can draw a line so we can say that at this particular it is starting to fall down so therefore uh, decreasing trend in viscosity is occurring so it is at a higher shear rate now this is very important the amplitude sweep what we do is that in amplitude sweep we keep on sending a strain in the form of a sine function with increasing amplitude keeping the frequency constant so the frequency here is kept at 1 hertz while the strain is changed from 1 to 10 to the power of minus 1 to 1 to 10 to the power of 3 percentage I am writing. Huh? So it is uh, 0 0.1 percent, 0 point, uh, then 1 percent, 10 percent, 100 percent, then 1000 percent. So these are written here, okay, 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100,000. Now while doing this strain, while doing this changing amplitude, how does G prime and G double prime respond to? We will see that. Now before we see this trend, we need to look the power law index n. This n which I will show in the subsequent table, all have been found to be less than 1 which implies that these are of shear thinning nature. It means as you keep on increasing shear rate, the viscosity will go down. So it is n minus 1 is all is less than 1. So we are shear thinning behavior of this gel. This is the first important observation. Now if you see these different um, plots, the one which are filled lines, these are G prime which is the elasticity of the fluid and one which is without filling, these are called the loss modulus or the viscous like behavior. So if you see the uh, G prime is always greater than G double prime, so it means the elasticity is higher as compared to the viscosity, viscous behavior. So now you see uh, these are pretty high, it goes high, high, it stays linear also. It stays linear, linear, linear till I mean you can find out this region, I mean something like that. Here I mean there is no sharp point to take. It is here if you say it till linear then it may drop down. We will not take this point because here it already started deforming. So you have to take some point which is prior to that. Then you see at the particular point. Uh, this actually overtakes here crossover point. So for the violet one crossover point lies here, for the red one it lies here and the violet red and the green one somewhere it is here, here it is. So you have different crossover points subject to different samples because all of them have different composition. So this region where it is linear is called the linear viscoelastic regime LVR, we call this LVR. Okay, so this is you should understand what is the amplitude sweep. So you can program everything in a rheometer. You program this particular strain rate from input to the end. You program the frequency. Everything it will record both G prime and G double prime. So as I uh, in the previous slide, if you see, I made the crossover point somewhere here, then here, 
and then uh, somewhere here. So what I have seen the crossover is above than 300 percent strain. It says that the crossover is above 300. So if this is 100, 200, this is 300, no, something like that. So it is that is what it is 300 percent. So above 300, when more than 300 percent we are appearing a crossover, that is what it says. The LVR of hydrogen is analyzed to be 10 percent strain. So what do you mean by that? 10 percent means you draw a line here as I told you earlier, put it up, 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 because you know the other uh, variation is just tend to go down. So we take this point when it is exactly horizontal, this is very important, this is LVR. So the LVR we now have fixed a strain rate, the strain rate is 10 percent. So you should now in the next experiment, you should send a sinusoidal signal with 10 percent strain rate. I mean these are some characteristics that XG5 has higher modulus than XG other hydrogels. The reason is because XG5 has a higher proportion of xylan. If it is a higher proportion of xylan, though it is giving more strength to the hydrogel. So XG5 means this one, the violet one. Okay, the violet one uh, is saying it is uh, having a higher storage modulus. So that's what it is. The higher storage modulus means this violet is at the top of the other two. So it is having a higher storage modulus because of the higher content of xylan. Now frequency sweep, now you keep that 10 percent with you and now you vary the frequency, okay. Earlier what you did, you kept frequency constant varied the strain. From the LVR you obtained the strain rate, now you take the strain rate, keep it constant, vary the frequency, just the opposite. You vary the frequency from this 1 in 10 to the power of minus 2 to 1 in 10 to the power of 200 and see what is the effect. Now see this is the same effect you got the or y ordinate remains the same g prime and g double prime and this is the frequency. So you keep on increasing the frequency at the strain rate of 10 percent you see again you see these all these regions have high the modulus is dominating the storage modulus is dominating as compared to the you know the loss modulus at this point you see the crossover frequency or something the crossover frequency where both the points modulus curve intersects. So that the point where it intersects, the domination of the gel point gets demonstrated. Until the gel point, hydrogels have a higher value of storage mode due to the elastic nature of cross-linking. Now after the gel point, the loss modulus has a higher value than storage modulus. So which is obvious because the you know this uh, it will start to flow, the entire uh, structure of the gel is broken under the intense frequency. So it will start to flow, if it starts to flow it means you will have a higher value of G double prime which is the loss modulus, that is what it is written here. Now some more inferences from this particular plot that is um, XG5 again which we saw earlier same thing has been demonstrated here, the amplitude sweep same for frequency sweep XG5 has the highest crossover frequency. The crossover frequency XG5 is highest means uh, it intersects at a very end point is 100, see this is a 100, that is why it says it is 100 hertz. So 100 hertz XG5 is seen, where the other ones actually crossover frequency if I can it is less, in the red one it is less than 100 and green gets further less. So it means this might be due to the higher, again we are uh, attributing this particular phenomena due to the higher amount of xylan. So as the amount of xylan is high, if you have high amount of xylan, you have more amount of OH moieties and these OH moiety will be creating more cross-linking between the precursors. So this is the frequency sweep. Now if I want to divide this G double prime and G prime, this will give the loss tangent. So divide the viscous nature by the elastic nature, then you plot it. If you plot, you will have a value of loss tangent, it is tan, tan uh, delta, this is tan delta in the y axis and the frequency in the x axis. You plot it, you will see the blue one, sorry the violet one will be the lowest and uh, the point where it actually loss tangent is greater than unity means at higher frequency uh, we have let us say greater than 12 hertz, the 12 hertz means somewhere here 10, 
somewhere here. So, at this higher frequency, loss tangent in greater than unity. So, this, so if I draw a straight line at 1 and at this particular 12, actually 12 is not here, I am sorry, this will be, this is a log plot. So, 12 is here actually, so, sorry. So, uh, you see uh, greater than 12, uh, all of them, if you could take the uppermost part, this part, the loss changes greater than unity, means what? The viscous nature has uh, overtaken the elastic nature, that is what it is, just, just a different way of representation. So, it is much more clearer than the previous one, because here you can easily see, okay, if it is greater than 1, it, it is at that point, it has exceeded the elastic nature. Plotting is easy, another way of looking, but the property is the same. So, as I told you earlier, it is because of the phase transition of hydrogels from gel to solution, which happens when the elastic character of gels weakens, okay, this is a loss tangent. So, at this point and above, it is greater than 1, it means elasticity is gone, the viscous behavior has come up. Now, the temperature sweep. Now, uh, issue is this temperature sweep is not done, kindly uh, recollect this temperature is not done on the sample itself. It is not done on the sample itself, it is done during the preparation. So, it is in situ preparation means I take two compounds A and B as a precursor, put it in a solution, then measure these G prime and G double prime, how it varies with temperature and the next part I will talk time. Okay? Please notice and please remember, it is not on the gel itself, it is on the precursor. So, it is written here, temperature sweep measurements are performed using a combination of, we take xylan, gelatin and the crosslinker in a particular, in a two neck flask, then the temperature range we vary from 25 to 90, it is 25 to 90 at a rate of 1 degree Celsius. So, we apply the heating slowly at the rate of 1 degree Celsius per minute. Now, here we are using the properties which we are obtained from frequency and the amplitude sweep. See, from the frequency we got 1 hertz and this is 10 percent as strain rate. We keep this, then send the signal and then record the G prime, G double prime. Now, initially if you see all the one which is unfilled, okay, these are all unfilled one, these are higher, now it is the other way around. So, here you have viscous to be more than elasticity, which is true because they are in solution phase. You have started from the uh, precursor, which is liquid phase. So, liquid phase means viscous. So, you have a higher value of the loss modulus as compared to the storage modulus. Now, as the temperature increases like that, this, this is going like this, you will have to find out the point where it just crosses. Again, you find the crossover point. The crossover point is different for different uh, material. So, in this case, you can see somewhere here, but the violet one somewhere here, a red one, uh, it comes before here and for green one, it overtakes here, somewhere here. So, we can say this is that particular temperature where actually the gel formation takes place because after this gel formation takes place, now you see what happens. All these filled values becomes higher than the unfilled values. So, now the loss modulus is lower than the storage modulus. Storage modulus has overtaken the loss modulus everywhere, corresponding green, corresponding red. So, until the gelation point, we may see a solution phase, but after gelation point, gelation point is this temperature, okay, this is a gelation point. Here the gel is forming. Gel is formed, the gel phase transition from solution to a gel. So, this is how you actually observe the preparation of this type of gels. It is called temperature sweep. You change the temperature, at different temperature, you go and measure with the rheometer applying this frequency and strain rate. Uh, what all you can say? Okay. So, this is the temperature I told you 44 to 49. I told you na, in the earlier part, the 44 to 49, this is the temperature where all the gels are getting formed, okay, 44 to 49. So, it says that the gelatin temperature rises as the gelatin concentration decreases. So, it means that more the amount of xylan is there, you will have decreasing gel temperature formation, okay. So, the greatest gelation temperature is seen in XG5 because of the high xylene content and low gelatin compound. Okay? 
that is what it is saying. So, this is about the I mean the properties of the precursor. You may be having a different precursor, you may have a different uh, observation. So, this was not to be followed for all the observation with respect to this is particularly with respect to my own precursor gelatin and xylan. Okay. So, this may be different for your sample. So, if you get a sample you can then easily check the temperature and now we will come to the temperature sweep then time sweep. Now, temperature we found out it is 44 to 49 and what is the time? How much time do, do this gel form? Same thing you do, but do not do it on the starting material, you do it on the precursor material. So, again you fix the frequency and strain at 1 hertz and 10 percent. Now, again in the initial part, initial time, the total time you can take is around close to 60 minutes, 1 hour. In the 1 hour you see again the loss modulus is dominating in the initial part as compared to the storage modulus, the unfilled portion are above as compared to the filled position. Now, you will have to observe at what time it actually overtakes. Now, here it overtakes at this point. In the case of red, it overtakes very fast. I mean, it may form immediately, not even time has started, it has formed a gel because it has overtaken the loss modulus. In the green part, you see here it is forming. Now, times are different. So, for xg5, for xg5, it is here, for xg red one is xg1, it is here, and uh, this one is xg3. So, you see different starting materials have different time of formation. So, all these are set to form between 2 to 30 minutes because this is around 2 minutes and this is around 30 minutes. So, all the gels are forming between these time range. So, it means that you can fix the time, you can fix the temperature at that time and temperature only you can conduct the experiment. So, due to the varying molar ratios of the chemicals, the substantial variation in gel time is seen between Xg1 and Xg5. Now, due to the greater moles of gelatin, so Xg5 has less number of moles of gelatin. So, Xg1 gels are easily crosslinked. So, gelatin NH2 is easily crosslinked with OH when the composition, the amount of moles of xylan is less. A single crossover point found in the temperature and time sweep investigation support the production of copolymer hydrogel. So, we found out a single crossover point because nowhere you see another crossover, you have a single crossover whether it is temperature or time which can confirm that these are copolymer hydrogels and these are crosslinked in nature. Okay. These are the two important observations. Now, we concludingly what we see is we have the three different gel. We have the m value, this is the constant for the power law and the n value. See this all this n is less than 1. So, n minus 1 is also less than 1 and they are fitted well with the power law model. The gel point, uh, in the frequency of the gel point is different for different hydrogel 50, 12, 100 and the gelation temperature lies between uh, 44 to 49 which I was just comparing and gelation time also varies from 2 to 30. Okay. These are the gelation time and gelation temperature. So, that is what we summarize from all the geological test. So, this is very important and you will come to know of your own sample in this manner how they are behaving, what is this different gel point, gel temperature from the rheological study only, you do not need to do any other study. From the rheometer only you can get this results. So, I am concluding this lecture. So, all the figures, illustration, tables which you have seen in the slide, they are actually taken up with due permission from my article synthesis and characterization of xylan gelatin cross-linked reusable hydrogel for the adsorption of methylene blue. So, these are our authors. I acknowledge these authors Pratik Gami, Devashish Kundu, Dilip Kumar and this is the volume number of the article and uh, it has been taken a permission from Elsevier. So, this is what I have discussed is a part of it. You can go through this article, you will get to know more of this. The journal name is Carbohydrate Polymer. And as before, you please go through this book where more detailing of the loss and tangent, loss modulus and storage modulus is given in this book. And as before, you follow this NPTEL course, Rheology of Complex Materials for further derivation, detailed derivation. So, thank you and uh, from the next class.
class we will start with the module 4 and I will start with the X-ray photon electrospectroscopy. Thank you.